Good evening and welcome to the June 5th, 2023 regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council. Uh, it's kind of unusual for us to hear the the opening music for our, uh, for our meetings, but it was kind of cool. It was kind of fancy. <laughs> um, okay, first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to invite Ben Wagner, fourth grader from St. Martin's School, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Great job, man. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next item on our agenda is reflection, and I would like to call for a moment of silence, please. Thank you all very much. Next item on our agenda is approval minutes tonight. We have two sets of minutes before us. The first is from the regular meeting on Monday, May 1st. What is the pleasure of the council? Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the minutes of Monday, May 1st. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay, that carries unanimously. Next we have the minutes from the work session on Monday, May 22nd. What is the pleasure of the council? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve the minutes from the May 22nd work section. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That carries unanimously. Um, next, we have presentations. And for this first one, I'm going to invite Chief Sroka and Doug Wagner to join me at the podium for uh, the Chief's Award. Uh, presentation. Sorry. It's been a while. <laughs> All right, good evening. And I just want to give a special welcome to Doug's family that's here tonight, his wife and their three children, and also his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Wagner. And to you, Mr. <coughs> Wagner, I want you to know, uh, I have not forgotten our conversation when you came to visit me at the station in April. And that flag that you presented to me, I promise you, we will fly that on the first day that we move into that new police station in honor and in remembrance of your late brother. So thank you for your kind gesture in doing that. We all very much appreciate it. And to um, you, Doug, um, although you are relocating thus precluding your further service here. Please know that you will always be fondly remembered and that your many contributions over the years as a member of the Police Advisory Committee are and will remain very much appreciated. The Chief's Award can be presented to any citizen for contributions and assistance provided to the Police Department that assist us with keeping the city safe and in striving to make it even safer. Doug Wagner has fulfilled that role for 10 years and four months, both as a member of the Police Advisory Committee and also as the chairman of the Police Advisory Committee. One of the things I always remember about Doug is he was at just about every Police Advisory Committee meeting. And back in the day, we used to meet monthly now it's evolved into where we meet on a quarterly basis. And Doug was the one constant that would show up at those meetings. The only exceptions when Doug was not in attendance at a meeting was when there was a work scheduling conflict or if Doug had a health-related issue that precluded his attendance. But when Doug was there, he was always the voice of reason, a calming influence, and always kept the committee members on point where when we dealt with problems in this community, we would deal in the facts. There was no drama with Doug. And that enabled us to solve problems and make a difference in this community for the better. If we had more Doug Wagners in this world, this world would be a much better place. So Doug, thank you for everything that you have done. And you are and will always remain a part of the Gatesburg Police family. So if you or your family ever need anything, you only need to ask. For his outstanding commitment as the chairman 
of the Police Advisory Committee and for his contributions to the citizens of the City of Gaithersburg and to the Gaithersburg Police Department. I am proud to bestow and distinguish Mr. Doug Wagner with the 2023 Chiefs Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, our next presentation will be our Juneteenth proclamation, and I'm going to have Council Vice President Henderson read the background material, then I will read the proclamation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On June 19, 1865, Union soldiers and General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation, two and a half years after it was signed. About six months after Granger brought the message to, of emancipation to Texas, Congress ratified the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, formally abolishing slavery. Since June 19, 1866, freed slaves have marked the day to celebrate the, their independence. The day is now honored as Juneteenth, also known as Black Independence Day, Freedom Day, and Jubilee Day. The city of Gaithersburg celebrates June, Juneteenth Freedom Day as an official city holiday and further recognizes its importance with a proclamation urging all citizens to become more aware of the significance of this celebration in African American history and in the heritage of our nation and city. City programming in recognition of Juneteenth. <coughs> city offices will be closed on Mon Monday, June 19th in celebration of the Juneteenth holiday. A complete list of closures will be available on the city's website. The city of Gaithersburg will acknowledge Juneteenth during the Jubilation Day gospel concert on Saturday, June 10th, taking place from 3 to 7 p.m. at the City Hall Concert Pavilion, and it is a must attend. The Benjamin Gaither Center presents the story of Joshua Henson and, and Edmondson, Edmondson Sisters, a lecturer exploring two remarkable stories of enslavement and freedom in Montgomery County with Reverend Cynthia Epp. It takes place on June 23rd at 11 a.m. You're going to be receiving this proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, proclamation uh, from the mayor and city council of Gaithersburg. Whereas June 19th, 2023, best known as Juneteenth, Freedom Day, marks the 158th anniversary of the arrival of Union General Gordon Granger to Galveston, Texas, where two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, African Americans learned of the end of enslavement. And whereas slavery in Maryland lasted for more than 200 years, from its beginnings in 1642, when the first Africans were brought as slaves to St. Mary's City, and whereas on May 14, 2014, Maryland became the 43rd state to recognize Juneteenth as National Freedom Day, and whereas Gaithers, in Gaithersburg we must collectively strive to close gaps of immeasurable distance between us and affirm the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and hold that the purpose of the American government must be to secure these rights for all. And as Americans, we must never forget or repeat the vivid and tragic examples of African American history that expose the dehumanizing impact of racial violence and we must reject acts of violence and expand opportunities to understand and learn from our frank and complex conversations. Now, therefore, I, Judd Ashman, by the power vested in me as mayor of Gaithersburg, respectfully unite with municipal leaders across the country in spirit and solidarity and do hereby proclaim Monday, June 19th, 2023, as Juneteenth, to acknowledge the historical significance of the day and recommit the city to working toward the dismantling of institutionalized racism. Proclaim this fifth day of June, 2023, signed by me. Let's give Lisa a round of applause. <laughs> Our next proclamation is for Pride Month, um, and I'm going to have 
Ryan come up here and help with the background material. And I'm going to invite Emily McDermott, who is receiving the proclamation, and anybody here with her that like to, would like to join. Um, Ryan, you take it away. Good evening, everyone. Pride Month is celebrated annually in the United States during the month of June. The month of June has become a symbolic month around the world for LGBTQ plus people and allies to come together in various celebrations of acceptance and equality. And the city of Gaithersburg, the most diverse city in America, is certainly no exception. We're very proud to support Pride Month and its activities. Uh, and I encourage you to check out uh, the new uh, social media logo that we have for the month of June. Uh, and uh, I also want to express how proud we are as a city that we have been given a 100% perfect rating on the Municipal Equality Index, which is published by the Human Rights Campaign. The city will be celebrating Pride Month with a variety of programs, including Diverse at Casey with poetry readings by DC Pride, Discovery Days at the Community Museum to learn about rainbows, Story Times at the Community Museum and Casey Community Center. The Arts Barn will offer a story time, a student art exhibit titled We Are Family, live performances of The Laramie Project, a showing of the film Me, Myself, and Her, and Improbable Comedy, a comedy and magic show. On July 8th, Observatory Park will hold How to Be an Astronaut with Brian Murphy, who is a PhD candidate in astronomy and astrophysics, and also a fellow of the Out Astronaut Project. Accepting the proclamation this evening is Emily McDermott, a social studies teacher and sponsor of the Gender and Sexuality Alliance at Northwest High School. Ms. McDermott is passionate about teaching civic education because people are empowered when they understand how their system of government works and how they can influence it. She encourages her students to take what they learn in the classroom and use it to create a positive change in their community. Some examples of projects students have initiated include starting a rainbow library, implementing gender neutral bathrooms, participation in diversity night, holding a pronoun day, and working with the MCPS Bridge to Wellness program. <clears throat> right. And we need to get you guys to the book festival next year, too. Um, proclamation of the Mayor and City Council of Gaithersburg. Whereas the month of June has become a symbolic month around the world for LGBTQ plus people and allies to come together in various celebrations of acceptance and equality, and whereas the long and ongoing struggle of transgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and other historically marginalized groups for basic civil and human rights continues to provide inspiration to all. And while society at large increasingly supports LGBTQ plus equality, it is essential to acknowledge that the need for education, awareness, and empowerment remains vital to end discrimination, inequity, and prejudice. Now, therefore, I Judd Ashman, by the power vested in me as mayor of Gaithersburg, do hereby proclaim June 2023 as Pride Month throughout the city of Gaithersburg. Proclaim this fifth day of June 2023 and signed by me. Let's give Emily a big round of applause. Good evening. The applicant, Episcopal Church of the Ascension, submitted an amendment to the concept site plan application ASDP 9578-2023 for 202 South Summit Avenue, shown on the aerial here, that requests a change in use pursuant to section 24-198C of the city code. The property is zone CD, corridor development. The applicant is requesting to convert its 2,860 square feet of office space to educational use. 
in order to accommodate SciTech to you, a nonprofit that uh, provides scientific instruction and activities to children from kindergarten through 12th grade. This application does not propose any physical changes to either the exterior of the, to, of the building or to the site. Uh, section 24-198C2 provides direction for the amendment to concept plan application. It says that after staff provides the council with a courtesy review, which we're doing right now, uh, council has two options that I'll summarize. The first is the council can find that the application has a minor effect and thereby direct the planning commission to make a final decision on the amendment. Or the second one, the council may direct the amendment to be referred to the planning commission for further evaluation public hearing and recommendation, the council shall thereafter approve or disapprove the recommendation of the Planning Commission within 45 days. Staff recommends that the council <coughs> find the application to have a minor effect and direct the Planning Commission to make a decision, final decision on the amendment. Finally, the change in use requires the shared parking to be amended, which you can't see too well. Um, the parking chart is in red. They have 73 spaces on the property, but they only need 15 spaces uh, for the proposed use. So are there any questions? Thank you, Chris, for the uh, explanation presentation. Uh, I, from my perspective, I see no reason why we shouldn't uh, take staff recommendation and, and deem the application as a minor effect and direct it to the Planning Commission. Uh, any comments or questions? Or would someone, do we need, let's see, do we need a motion? We probably do. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we deem the application to have a minor effect and direct the Planning Commission to make a final decision on the amendment. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, that carries 5 0. Thank you very Thank much, you. Chris. Okay, next on our agenda is public comments. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're getting there, Rob Robinson. We're getting there. Maybe Rob has some public comments. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe he wants to testify. It's true. I'm so excited about the public comments. <laughs> okay. All right. Before this gets too out of hand, uh, this is the time the mayor and council would like to hear from anybody who'd like to speak on any topic other than a public hearing topic. Tonight, we do have one public hearing on the housing element of our master plan. So if you're here or if you're on Zoom and you want to speak about that, just hold on. We'll, we'll get to that. But if you'd like to speak on any other topic, uh, we ask that you state, come to the podium, state your name uh, and address or neighborhood for the record. Um, keep your comments no more than three minutes. And um, if you have more than three minutes worth of material to deliver, then by all means use the three minutes and just send us the rest in writing. It'll be considered just the same. Do we have, do we have anybody in the room who'd like to testify? It seems like everyone's, most of us are staff or planning commission here. Okay, most of us. Okay, let me just look and see if we have... Anybody on Zoom? Uh, is there, if anybody on Zoom would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Not seeing any? Okay. Um, then we will close that public comments. And now we will invite Rob Robinson uh, to the table along with David Christiel. And let's talk about um, the housing Master, housing element of the master plan. And we're glad to be joined by our, the members of the Planning Commission. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the Council and members of the Planning Commission. This is the joint public hearing on Master Plan Amendment MP123, the draft city of Gaithersburg housing element. This hearing was advertised in the May 18th and 25th editions of the Washington Post and on the city's website. The public hearing draft was released March 9th, March 9th 2023 to begin the formal 60-day comment period. At the present time, there are 15 exhibits in the record. These exhibits are uh, referenced in an uh, index memoranda. The individual exhibits may be reviewed at any time on the city's website or during regular business hours at City Hall. Any objections to any exhibit should be noted prior to the closing of the record. Otherwise, they will be deemed received into evidence. 
So joining me, obviously, this evening is uh, Mr. Chris Steele. Uh, so to begin the presentation, uh, the housing element development, um, and I'll be up front, you've seen basically this presentation three times already, <laughs> so with some minor changes, so there shouldn't be any surprises. Um, the state of Maryland pa passed House Bill 1045 in 2019, requiring the inclusion of a housing element in all comprehensive master plans. At a minimum, the housing element is to address low income and workforce housing, but we have taken this as an opportunity to address you know, housing policies in general. So the development of the housing uh, element, you know, we launched a project page, we created a bunch of surveys, uh, we conducted a bunch of stakeholder meetings, we used best practices, we studied academic journals, um, everything to inform developing this master plan. So the development of the master plan, you know, also included four joint work sessions. The first one was about the contents and organization where we received support. Um, the next was the draft goals and policies um, for policies and programs. The third was the goals and recommendations for planning and zoning and the equity and social justice. And the fourth work session, um, the Council and the Planning Commission reviewed the complete draft element and then directed staff to release for the formal comment period. So as mentioned, March 9th, we released the document for the 60 days. Um, official notifications went to all the required agencies pardon me, including Maryland Department of Planning, Montgomery Planning, the Department, Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and others. Uh, the Metropolitan Council, uh, Washington, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments was sent, and a collection of housing-focused organizations such as uh, the County HOC, the Afforded Ho Affordable Housing Conference of Montgomery County, and Housing for All. No notice was also posted on the project page and through a press release and social media. Um, we also conducted two virtual public forums on May 4th. The recordings of those forums are placed in the record. Um, so for the structure of the element, as to remind everyone, it includes basically up front seven chapters. And we'll go through. So the first one is the introduction that discusses, once again, the state requirement, a uh, high-level discussion of housing, and the city's statement, vision statement, that the city of Gaithersburg strives to ensure all current and future residents from all socioeconomic populations have access to a diverse range of quality home ownership and rental housing choices that are affordable, equitable, and livable. Uh, the second section is the glossary, which is sort of self-explanatory. But what we're going to do this evening with the presentation where it differs from the ones you've seen before is we're going to talk about the recommended edits that we want to do. Um, so with the glossary, our recommended edits, and in parentheses is the organization potentially that, that offered you know, in response to. Um, we want to add the state's definition of low-income and workforce housing, but definitely add a footnote that they differ from the city's definitions. Uh, we want to define the term pop priority populations. Again, that was in response to Maryland Department of Planning. We want to define better common ownership communities. I think it helps in the discussion later on. And we want to define the commission on common ownership communities. Get this, get this right up front in the glossary because there are some further discussions about these. Um, moving on, the next section is the background. Again, this includes a timeline of city housing initiatives and efforts, a complete overview of demographic and socioeconomic data, uh, a discussion and, and identification of regulated and market rate affordable units. It also includes the two analyses that we've talked about many times, the affordability gap analysis and the turnover analysis. Um, it includes our pipeline projections and includes maps, graphs, charts to express these items in a user-friendly and has a collection of key points. <clears throat> so for our recommended edits, we'd like to add a footnote regarding MW COGS regional housing targets and it may be more importantly how Gaithersburg has met their proportional goal um, going forward. Um, we want to add language to emphasize how small of a total land area is taken up by single-family detached housing. Um, that's a percentage of the total land area. Um, and we want to add data for homeowners associations and condominium associations as relates to housing, specifically the number and distribution of units by type in HOA, you know, under essentially the auspices of HOA and condominium units. Section four through six really gets in the meat. This is where we have the goals and various recommendations. Um, as everybody may remember, we divided it into three sections, planning and zoning, city programs and policies, and equity and social justice. Um, structurally, they're all the same. They begin with an in introductory narrative and any additional data when needed, a collection of goals and recommendations, of course, and the key points from this section. 
So for planning and zoning, again, the intent is to address how city zoning and planning efforts can promote and support housing. There are two main goals, promote or create opportunities for a variety of housing types for current and future city residents of all income levels with costs that reflect the range of incomes. And the second one being the plan for amenities, plan for amenities and infrastructure so that existing neighborhoods may remain resilient and new housing is sited in neighborhoods with a community identity. So for this section, our recommended edits in response to Maryland Department of Planning is at a discussion of the impacts of housing on the need for public facilities and how they are addressed in the city through zoning, the current city strategic plan and master plans. Um, and, and per what was discussed by MDP, this isn't just necessarily APFO, it's, it's a broader discussion, you know, in, in a bunch of amenities and social support needs. Um, at a recommendation to identify areas that could benefit from federal and state funding programs and projects. So those are the two for that section. Um, for city programs and policies, this section addresses the role and actions of the city's housing program. Once again, there are three goals. Preserve existing affordable homes, both market rate and regulated. Help people remain in their housing and provide access to affordable homes. And identify, promote, and consider incentives that produce homes the market does not produce to meet community needs. So with staff recommended edits, we have uh, at a footnote about the list of Department of Housing and Community Development programs that could benefit the city, add a map of the GALP opportunity versus standard area um, delineations, add a discussion recommendation of the strategies to maintain affordability of regulated units. Uh, this was partially in response to comments from Montgomery County Planning. Um, at a recommendation regarding exploring ways to more proactively support HOA and condominium boards and owners with respect to issues of affordability and equity that affect the overall housing stock, supply, and affordability in the city. And that was something that sort of came out of the last work session. Moving on to chapter, uh, section six is the equity and social justice. Um, this addresses issues that were in part identified in you know, Mr. Chris Steele's analysis of impediments, fair housing plan, and include racial and socioeconomic equity issues and institutional structural barriers. Um, really, the element identifies three distinct issues and approaches, actions the city can take to create a climate that offers opportunity, address structural barriers in the lending and real estate industry, and address issues related to the city's elderly and disabled population. Again, there were four goals in this section, advanced city tools that create a foundation for opportunity and wealth creation, Leverage city advocacy efforts for tools that create a foundation for opportunity and wealth creation. Support and advocate for actions or organizations that remove structural barriers in the lending and real estate industries and promote equitable, affordable housing opportunities. And lastly, ensure the availability and consideration of needs for senior housing and housing for individuals with disabilities. Um, staff recommended edits include add the map of the equity emphasis areas. You know, that was for us very, wow, we didn't include that, it sort of made sense. Um, and add or amend recommendations to, to support financing tools that can help HOAs um, and the CCOCs to preserve and extend both unit affordability and condition. The current existing section seven is the recommendation matrix. This lists all the recommendations and provides a time frame for implementation as well as responsible parties. The time frame of zero to five years refers to new actions that will be implemented in that time frame. Five to 10, obviously, you know, five to 10 years. And ongoing indicates actions that will continue beyond initial implementation or are already underway. Um, we don't have a formal recommendation with this, but obviously any changes to the three previous sections with new recommendations would then be reflected in the recommendation matrix. What are we proposing? Uh, an additional edit heading into the Planning Commission approval. Um, in response to comments from Maryland Department of Planning, we would like to do a, pro an, a proposed appendix. Um, and this is to add revised maps and charts from section 3.3 that illustrate low income and workforce housing using the state's income and cost definition rather than the city's regional definitions and add a brief discussion of the Housing and Transportation Affordability Index. Um, of note, and while I don't necessarily have the numbers right at hand, um, the state's comments uses the statewide data. <coughs> Throughout our document, we either used um, data specific to the city of Gaithersburg or the national capital region, which is very much different than the state of Maryland. But their comment was, hey, because of the law, 
you have to do some sort of analysis using state data. So that's really where we want to do the, you know, handle this through the appendices, but we still feel the existing Section 3, especially 3.3, is more germane to what we see going on the ground because it's using data for this immediate region. So next steps, um, staff will amend the plan per any guidance received this evening during the public hearing and prior to the planning commission's record closing. And we have two records recommended. One thing I would like to rem remind everyone is this being a master plan, the process is somewhat different than other plans that come before these bodies. Um, technically, under the land use article, it is the planning commission that approves the master plan and then recommends adoption by the legislative body. So the legislative body then has the ability to adopt the planning commission's approval. Any changes that they wish to make restarts the public hearing process. So this is another reason why we sort of want to be up front with the changes that we are proffering or with this joint public hearing to hear any changes either body wants us to make so there are no surprises when we go before planning commission. And obviously David and I are here. We are happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Rob. David, um, it's, it's taken us some time to get here, but I, I generally, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna opine on this yet. I wanna, this is the time we wanna hear from the public, but I, I do wanna open it up for questions or comments uh, from Mayor Council, planning commission, not seeing any. Okay. Well, then let's go ahead and open it up for the public. Um, if there's anybody who'd like to testify um, as to the housing element, this would be the time. Same rules as always. State your name, address, or neighborhood. Um, uh, you can testify for up to three minutes. But if you have more than that, just send us the rest in writing. Um, is there anybody here who'd like to testify? Going once, going twice. All right, let me check Zoom. Oh, okay. No one else is at <laughs> I at least, uh... Hi, David Mullins, uh, Gateway Apartments. Uh, I just wanted to add a positive note that I like. I think it's an exciting document overall. And, you know, we're just, as advocates, we hope when the, you know, rubber hits the road that, that we can, you know, work together to, to achieve some of the goals. But, like, I think overall it's just, like, very uh, candid about, uh, the, the situation for renters is specifically and so thank you for that and just a just kind of a yeah but thanks thank you david um all right let me check on zoom and see if we have anybody who if there's anybody on zoom who'd like to testify just use the raise hand button going once going twice <clears throat> okay um all right so with that then i guess i will go to the planning commission uh, any comments? Because I don't want to go immediately go to the recommendation if anybody had any comments on the draft. I'll, I'll just add a touch of praise for staff. Can't overdo it because, you know. But uh, <laughs> it's really, it's really, really a, a great document. And I've, I've already, even in a draft, sent it around to some of my compatriots in other jurisdictions. It's really um, impressive. And I think uh, we live in a hyperbolic world, particularly in the investment side of things, particularly in the very difficult housing and development side of the world. And having real data <coughs> is absolutely essential to getting anything accomplished. And the staff did a wonderful job of both graphically, I know we've talked, Rob, about this for decades now, uh, but graphically and uh, informationally, just putting all that data in a document, single document, formatting it well, and then putting it out in the public is, is exactly what we should be doing. So it's really great. It's inspiring. So. High praise. Yeah. Well done. Excellent. Okay. Any other? Okay. Um, staff recommends the Planning Commission hold their record open until 5 p.m. July 21st, 2023, with an anticipated approval and recommendation on August 2nd, 2023. Is there a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 5 0. Mr. Mayor. Okay. And our recommendation is that we hold our record open until 5 p.m. on August 18th. Um, with anticipated adoption on September 18th of this year. What's the pleasure of the council? So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, that carries unanimously. So our records are open. If anybody from the public would like to comment, uh, this anytime between now and July 21st for the Planning Commission and now and August 18th for the Mayor and Council. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Next on our agenda is 
from the mayor and city council. And tonight we are going to start with Council Vice President Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't have uh, much before you this evening. I, I did attend the, um, on February, on oh, February, on May 30th, I did attend the Memorial Day observance. It was great that we were back in, in Christman Park. That was fantastic. We, the weather was incredible. So, um, and the soloist that sang the national anthem was absolutely amazing. I hope we have her again, back again with us next year. Um, Chloe Jackson. Chloe we've had Jackson. Her, we've had her before, and she is excellent. A excellent. It was a very and then a very moving uh, service, and well deserved of all those who who laid their lives on the line just to so that we can breathe uh, and much appreciated and honored. I am going to read an announcement. Gatesburg residents will cast their ballots for three city council members on Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. The city is conducting a hybrid election for 2023. All registered voters will receive a mail-in ballot application. Applications can be returned via United States Postal Service, dropped off at City Hall, or completed electronically. One vote center will be located at the Activity Center at Boer Park for in-person voting. In addition, there will be seven ballot drop boxes located throughout the city. Early voting sessions will be held at the Activity Center on Sunday, October 29th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Vote Center will be open on Election Day, Tuesday, November 7th from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. For complete election information, go to <coughs> www.gathersburgmd.gov slash elections or contact Elections Clerk Lauren Klinger at 240-805-1087 or email cityelections at gathersburgmd.gov. Thank you very much, Lisa. We're going to go to Jim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to echo my... Uh, my happy Pride Month uh, to everyone. Uh, as Councilmember Spiegel pointed out, diversity is one of Gaithersburg's uh, great strengths, and our LGBTQ plus community contributes such a wonderful color, color to our community. Uh, and I look forward to celebrating uh, throughout the month with our community. Uh, one, ad, I know it was said at our work session, but I just want to say what an amazing event the Gaithersburg Book Festival was. Um, I know it's been a few weeks, but. Um, and it was really nice that the weather cooperated this year. Uh, we weren't cooked to death, so that was great. Uh, and I also want to give another kudos to staff and, and the, the volunteers and the planning that went into it. Um, I know in years past there have been some uh, suggestions raised about increasing the amount of food that was available, and I thought there was a great selection, and uh, it really seemed to go really well. So uh, cheers to everybody who worked on that. Uh, I had the honor of serving on uh, Senator Kagan's Senatorial Scholarship Committee uh, for District 17, and uh, myself and the committee had the opportunity to interview uh, 12 outstanding students uh, who were finalists for the scholarship. Uh, just hearing uh, the work that these students have been doing academically in the community, demonstrating leadership, um, it, it's really impressive, and, and uh, we were all joking um, that uh, we need to get our acts in gear because uh, they were just impressive and, and kind of showing us up a little bit. Um, so I know the center has not made uh, announcements yet, but um, honestly, everybody that we met with uh, were, were deserving. So it was a, an honor to, to serve on that committee, uh, with, who, which uh, included former council member Yvette Monroe. Uh, so it was great to see her and uh, look forward uh, to hearing the announcements. And finally, uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to stop by the St. Martin Parish picnic across the street. Uh, there was food and music and games and uh, people trying to climb a greased 30-foot pole in, over at uh, Father Meyer Field. What is this, uh, Philadelphia? It was quite something, It was, which is I probably needed to bring in the Philly folks to, just to get up the poles. Um, but it started with a trilingual mass. I don't know for those uh, not familiar with St. Martin's, but uh, St. Martin's has 11 different masses on the weekends, including Spanish, French, and English. And uh, all of the communities were there. There was Filipino food, there was African food, there was Salvadoran food. Um, I worked my way around the crowd. Um, it was delicious. 
and uh, it's just a, a wonderful time when you get to celebrate with uh, a faith community, one that I belong to, um, and just celebrate uh, all the wonderful things that, uh, that make it a great parish and make this a great city. So it was a lot of fun to be there, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You have also have- Oh, and I have an announcement. You are correct. Uh, Gaithersburg City residents will cast their ballots for three city council members on Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. Candidate packets were released on Thursday, May 11th. Packets can be picked up at City Hall by appointment or accessed on the city's election website. The last of two mandatory candidate sessions will be held on August 15th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Candidates are required to register for the session. Deadline for candidates to file is Thursday, August 24th by 5 p.m. For additional information or to register for training, please contact elections clerk Lauren Klingler at 240-805-1087 or email cityelections at gaithersburgmd.gov. And for complete election information, go to www.gaithersburgmd.gov slash elections. Thank you, Jim. We'll go to Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll echo again the comments that I made earlier about Pride Month. Uh, we're uh, very excited here in the city to celebrate it once again and to host a number of great events. Um, also, um, just sort of pleasantly amazed at how quickly Juneteenth has now become a regular celebration throughout the region and the country. Uh, after you know some 150 years of not getting the attention it deserved, um, I recall a few years ago how quickly things started to move when all of a sudden it became a state holiday. A number of us uh, testified in support of making it a state holiday. And then the next thing we knew, it was a federal holiday, uh, which is as it should be. And um, Council Vice President Henderson is absolutely right that our Jubilation Day gospel concert on June 10th is an event not to be missed, so I encourage you all to attend. Um, we had a number of events that uh, many of us attended over the last few weeks since our last formal uh, city council meeting. Uh, we did have a work session, but um, since, since uh, our last formal council meeting, it's been like three weeks. So uh, I also want to uh, reiterate all the congratulations to the mayor and to everyone who was involved in our fabulously successful book festival, uh, the sponsors, the volunteers, the staff, uh, the vendors, the authors, uh, everybody involved, and of course the participants who came and showed your support. Uh, and uh, we just, uh, we love that event and we're thrilled that it was a success yet again and congratulations to you, Mr. Mayor, and to everyone involved. Thank you. Um, some other events that I attended, uh, along with some others uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, our friends at the Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber of Commerce had their 20th annual wine tasting hosted at the Kentlands Mansion on May 17th. A number of us were able to attend and offer our support and good wishes. On May 18th, we had our monthly meeting of the Montgomery County chapter of the Maryland Municipal League, and I was able to attend. That meeting was virtual. Uh, and on May 21st, uh, the Montgomery County chapter of the NAACP had their annual Freedom Fund Gala uh, that I attended uh, on behalf of the city to represent, uh, and that was a great event. Um, uh, Council Vice President Henderson already mentioned the Memorial Day observance that I attended as well, and it really was powerful, and we had beautiful weather for it, um, and our speaker was great, uh, and uh, it was just a really nice event, as it always is in Chrisman Park. Um, on May 31st, uh, the mayor and I uh, attended the uh, presentation of the Historic Preservation Award at the Crown Corn Crib at the historic site. Uh, and that was actually a really cool event. We got to climb around on the Corn Crib uh, building, which I don't think you're allowed to do unless it's like, you know, supervised. But uh, a number of staff were with us and representatives of um, uh, the Maryland Historical Trust. And so that was really neat to congratulate not only the staff, but all of the vendors, architects, uh, construction folks who were involved in this great historic preservation project, which is right there in the middle of downtown Crown uh, and will be a community asset for many, many years to come as part of the park uh, that we are working on there. Uh, on June 1st, uh, I attended the Coaches Appreciation Picnic at the Water Park uh, to thank uh, all of our volunteer coaches for our rec leagues and our uh, uh, rec activities and sports activities, and it was really a great 
gathering. Uh, I wore uh, my Ted Lasso jersey and gave a little Ted Lasso themed pep speech, and uh, it went over very well in, a, in, a, in an event full of coaches, as you might imagine. Uh, so it's just really great to offer them uh, our thanks because they do this on a volunteer basis, and they are such a huge part of what makes our city an amazing place and an amazing community. You all know so many kids go through that program, whatever sport they play, whatever activity they're part of, uh, and the coaches really make a big difference in their lives. Um, and then um, finally, uh, on June 3rd, the mayor and I attended uh, an event hosted by Moms Demand Action uh, at Johnson's Park, which is just outside the city limits, um, and uh, was for Wear Orange Weekend, which is a nationwide um, advocacy uh, event to wear orange to draw attention uh, to the scourge of gun violence uh, and the need to do more uh, to address it. Um, it was a powerful event. I'm glad we were able to attend, and it was a good crowd. We had a lot of elected officials as well from the uh, state and county level joining us. Uh, and the organizers really did a, a fantastic job. I want to draw uh, everyone's attention to a couple events that are coming up this uh, next week. Uh, on June 8th, uh, WSSC is hosting an open house from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Activity Center at Borer Park. Um, and it's an opportunity for folks from the community to come and ask questions and learn about a number of the programs that WSSC uh, is now engaged in including uh, their Get Current program, which helps folks who might be behind on their water bills to get amnesty um, for some of those bills if you're eligible. Um, so I want to encourage folks to attend that event, um, ask questions, learn about the programs that WSSC is providing to the community as our partner. And um, in addition to the Jubilation Day concert on June 10th, in the morning of June 10th, our friends at Seneca Creek Community Church are hosting a festival that they're calling Hope Day, and uh, it's just open to the public, and I would encourage folks to check that out as well. Thank you all very much. Sorry for the long list, but uh, a lot of things happened over the last couple of weeks. Thanks, Ryan. We'll go to Neil. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, as, you, uh, as we go later and later in this, uh, in this set part of the meeting, uh, there's a lot of items on my list that, I've, that have already been mentioned, so I'm going to skip over them. I do want to say that whoever on city staff is responsible for managing the weather is doing a spectacular <laughs> job. It's the nicest spring that I can remember, and it's really helped some of the events like the Memorial Day observance and especially the book festival. Uh, so, uh, and also Bike to Work Day was, was the, one of the best Bike to Work Days I can remember, and thanks to Public Works and others who helped put it together. We had a huge turnout both in the morning and the afternoon. Usually we don't get that much of a turnout in the afternoon, but uh, it was a, a great event and hopefully we encourage more people to get some exercise and get out on their bicycles. Um, and the last one I'll mention is the first mandatory candidate training session for the upcoming election. Uh, I counted 10 people in attendance who were potential candidates this year. So looking forward to a very spirited campaign. We'll see how things go. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to see that we've got people that are interested in participating in governing this wonderful city of ours. That's it for me now. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Neil. We'll go to Rob. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, m much has been said. Um, I would in particular like to echo Council Member Spiegel's echoing of his prior comments on, on Pride Month. It was very well conceived. Um, I will mention that we attended the uh, flags for our, um, our heroes ceremony on Saturday um, before Memorial Day, always a wonderful um, event and, and surprisingly well attended by the, the politicos. Is there an election coming around or something? <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe it was just a great event to attend. Just a great event. Yeah. Um, announcement after closed executive session, a uh, closed meeting was held by the mayor and city council on Monday. May 22nd, 2023, at approximately 8.30 p.m., pursuant to a motion adopted unanimously. The meeting was proposed to uh, be closed pursuant to the general provisions article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, Section 3-305B1I, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom has jurisdiction. The topic discussed was the personnel matter to conduct the city. Attorney's annual performance review, present at the meeting were Mayor Ashman, council members, 
Har well, Council Vice President Henderson, then Council Members Harris, McNulty, Spiegel, and Wu. Upon conclusion of the discussion, the closed meeting was adjourned at approximately 8.35 p.m. Thank you, Rob. Um, pretty, almost everything has been uh, named, all the events. So I'm not gonna reiterate uh, other than, than to congratulate staff for a terrific Memorial Day service. Um, and one thing that wasn't mentioned was I want to commend the staff at the Community Museum for the 150th anniversary of the train uh, coming through Gaithersburg um, celebration, which was, which was really a kind of a cool event. And um, the uh, Gaithersburg High School band was out there. and It was good. It was really good. Um, so upcoming sessions next Next week, we will have um, a joint work session with the Planning Commission, um, Monday, June 12th, 7.30 p.m., to receive an update on the uh, Maryland, the 355 BRT project, Bus Rapid Transit project, and transportation land use connections in Old Town. Um, so mm -hmm. you can participate just to how you're participating tonight, either in person or over Zoom. Um, that will be on, again, June 12th, and then the next regular meeting of the mayor and council will be on Tuesday, June 20th, not the Monday because of Juneteenth, uh, Tuesday, 7.30 p.m., June 20th. And with that, I will turn it to the city, from the city manager. Thank you, Your Honor. I yield my time this evening. Okay. Then we will go to economic development update with Tom Lonergan Senior. Thank you, Mayor. I won't yield my time, but I'll keep it brief. I uh, wanted to mention that Gaithersburg's Hememics Biotech Congratulations, they just raised $2 million in new investment capital with Maryland Technology Development Corp. We know them as TEDCO. Uh, the company is located at 401 Professional Drive here in the city, and Hememics has developed a lab in hand device for blood tests and diagnostics. Uh, the company's sensor technology is more sensitive than existing point of care tools. Uh, their focus is on veterinarian health, and its biochip reader can rapidly detect multiple diseases uh, achieving higher accuracy out in the field more economically. Results are available in under five minutes with the option to upload to a data center with a cell phone. Uh, with this latest cash infusion, this nine-person company can scale up its manufacturing techniques and address future demand. Circling back to TEDCO, the organization which supported Hememics is an independent instrumentality of the state of Maryland, and as you probably know, the entity is charged with being the state's leading source of funding for early stage technology based businesses. And Hememics wasn't the only Gaithersburg company to re receive TEDCO's assistance of late. Uh, recently, Give Hero, we all familiar with them? They're located at Rio and partners with employers to help boost workers' engagement in wellness programs, raised a bridge round of $400,000 and received $200,000 from TEDCO's Social Impact Fund. Give Heroes Tech ties employees' wellness to workers' favorite causes. Uh, through Give Heroes' mobile first platform, employees raise money for their charities of choice through an employer donation matching process by participating in company sponsored wellness initiatives or just by doing healthy activities like going for a bike ride. Over the past few months, the company has hired seven people, including a chief revenue officer and now has 15 employees. So congratulations to both of them. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to ordinances, resolutions, and regulations. Rob Robinson is ready for his item. <laughs> and on time this time. And on time. Thank you, Mayor. This evening, I come before the council with a resolution to grant additional environmental waivers to the One Central Avenue project. Uh, the project itself was approved for SDP and rezoning on February 6, 2023, and as part of that was a collection of environmental waivers approved by separate resolution for basically five areas of the project, A through E, that totaled a little over 40,000 square feet in temporary impacts and 10,000 square feet of permanent impacts. As the applicant now is working towards final site plan and refining engineering, they've identified uh, an ability to relocate a sanitary sewer line and basically reduce the linear feet of the line from 204 to 124 feet. 
and really the important thing about this is this realignment equates to a reduced impact to the previously approved Area C stream valley buffer of 797 square feet with an overall reduction of over 3,000 when you build in the WSSC uh, easement that would be required. However, this realignment would require additional permanent impacts infrastructure and another WSSC easement of 2,493 square feet to areas A and E above what was approved in the previous waiver. But, however, this equates overall for the entire site to a reduction of 855 square feet of permanent impacts. Um, staff is supportive of this on the screen right now. Hopefully you will see the before and after. So in this first one, you know, this is the area that is being removed, the sanitary sewer line, and it basically runs parallel to the stream channel. By removing this, um, it'll afford us the ability with the forest con to do more tree plantings closer to bank, which from an environmental science, environmental planning perspective is much better. Um, this is, you know, the new alignment. And while I was waiting for council tonight, I figured it may be helpful uh, to see how this actually, you know, works with the existing approved waivers. So this was what was approved, you know, under the SDP, you know, I put new request over the line that was being removed, uh, but this is the new area that comes in. Um, of note, you know, once again, you know, it, it reduces a parallel impact to a perpendicular impact with the stream channel. Uh, the easement is the easement, uh, you know, that is the WSSC, we have to tie into sewer, there's really no viable alternatives um, for this. So again, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but again, staff is supportive of this because overall, you know, it's over 800 square feet of permanent impacts, um, and it does allow for some better environmental planning in Area C. Thank you, Rob. Questions, comments? Is this open um, drainage or open sewage or whatever? It's a sanitary sewer line, so it's, it's you know, draining, so it's actual underground, you know, sewer lines. Okay, but is it closed or is it absorbing? Like, is, are, is surface water or something flowing into it, or are these flowing out of the houses? <laughs> this is the sewer lines that connect to the houses to the okay. toilets. So this is then going into the main WSSC sewer line. And, and so they are not built to overflow. They're built to... You hear sometimes... and, and So I, I, I believe that's no longer allowed under Clean Water Act. Okay. So since 1972, <laughs> we've not been allowed to. to Every so often, you see reports from like it seems to be down county. There's overflows. And <laughs> well, those are pre-existing, yes. right? Okay. And I've unfortunately got too much experience with coming. And the state of Maryland's sewers. always had separated sewer systems going back to the development of Baltimore. So we're, we're not. We're in great shape. So the alignment will not, from perpendicular to, or from parallel to perpendicular, will not change the uh, risk of impacts from. Uh, again, here, uh, now that I have a better understanding of your question, you know, storm drains do not mix with sewer lines in the okay. state of Maryland and never have. And these are sewer, sewer these lines? These are strictly okay. sewer lines to serve all the residents. Does the new alignment impact any vegetation currently on site? Um, that will be difficult to say because the previously approved uh, waivers that were granted, you know, they're going to be grading through this whole site anyway. Um, so, you know, there's going to be change, and as we work towards final site plan, as we talked about during the rezoning and schematic development plan, is the detailed planting plan for all these conservation areas and areas in between these utilities. Okay, and anything different as far as specimen tree removal is? And I think the memo... Um, I think the memo said maybe one. Yeah, but was that one additional, or was that one that was approved in the pri previous one, and now it's... This would be an additional, because as shown on the screen right now, you know, the area that is to be impacted wasn't included in the original waivers. But candidly, I, you know, I can look in. I do not know if that was due to be removed for other situations, but as it relates to the environmental waivers, this would be an additional. Okay. Wouldn't there need to be another tree removal waiver if it's a specimen tree? I, I didn't see that in the back, that's why. Not at this point. It's a, it's a separate action. Okay. Jim. Thank you, Mayor. It seems to make a lot of sense. It's reducing the overall impact. It's removing the parallel. It, it allows the stream buffer to get a little more stabilized. Um, uh, obviously, like you said, they have to connect into the, <laughs> the sanitary sewer. Um, so for this to project to move forward, it's I think it's an important thing that we need to do. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Ryan. Just, just a sort of a logistical question. I'm trying to sort of visualize in my own mind what's involved in 
remediating or sort of backfilling the area where the parallel <coughs> gets removed. But I think what you said a minute ago is that the whole area is going to have to be, you know, graded and re-landscaped anyway. So it's not really going to matter because it'll be part of that whole larger effort. And again, because basically what is occurring here, remember they haven't started any construction. So that 204 feet of linear feet isn't going into the ground. So that disturbance associated with that line is not now going to occur. Um, you know, while it's still sort of quote unquote vested under the original, um, you don't grant waivers to not do disturbance. So you only grant waivers to do disturbance. So uh, the original waiver can remain in place, but really they're not going to implement it. You know, they'll, they'll have some other connections um, that may go through and other disturbance related to area C that was previously approved, but not related to the sanitary sewer line. Okay. Sorry, that brought up another question. Can we, if? Go ahead, okay. yeah. So if, if on in the C area, I guess the blue is no longer going to be impacted, but it was granted in a waiver. The blue is totally separate from the sanitary sewer line. So again, the focus of this. Okay, maybe I'm just confused here. I, I thought the the C the light blue C was what is no longer being impacted. Oh yes, on the on this blue. screen. I thought you were mentioning the the graphic that I had up on the screen. Okay. Um, if that was subject to a prior waiver due to the needs of, of the developer in that area that's no longer necessary, do we rescind that waiver? It remains in place because they just won't implement it. Again, the environmental waiver only allows you, permits you to do an action. It does not require you to do an action. Can we rescind that waiver if it's no longer needed for the project? I would defer to Frank and Council, but we'd have to come back because we have not done the math to see how that changes the approved resolution. But, so, is, I mean, is your purpose in asking the question because you believe that the developer would do this anyway? Like, would do both? Instead of instead of doing the going with the new plan, they would go with the old plan and the new plan? No, I mean, it's more that they came in with a request for a waiver. The waiver was granted for a justified reason that is no longer valid because they're changing their plan. I suppose in the abstract you could just leave it in place and, and let bygones be bygones, but the, the better housekeeping would be to rescind the waiver that's no longer needed. If I may, Mr. Wright, would it make more sense to amend the previous waiver? At this, I think this is where Rob's getting. Amend the previous waiver to what is really required versus leaving something that's not being utilized. What is that, Frank? What this he question? said, that guy. What is that, Frank? <laughs> Uh, you can do a revision, but as Rob was pointing out, this is only authority for them to ask. There's still an enforcement element from staff looking at it, and my guess is that staff are not going to allow them to do both. Well, they would have to can. decide but one way or the other. Right? I think, uh, if I may, I think the, the issue is that we can't at this point tonight isolate right. that the waiver is, the existing waiver only covers that particular pipe. There could be other, there could be other needs, uh, right? Again, if there's I, a I there's a there's a slew of waivers attached to it, so we'd have to really study it before we start to rescind things. Is or amend. Or amend. Or amend. A revision could or come forth, but that change. does require some analysis. Can, can I ask? Uh, sure, please. please. What's the additional administrative process that happens after a waiver is granted? Do they still have to come and get like a? construction or grading permit or they have to go stuff. Through, their so. final site plans have to reflect yeah. the waivers. So one, you know, removing the current impact out of Area C saves them a lot of money, to be candid with you, you know, running 204 feet. So the final engineering plans before it goes to planning commission are not going to reflect right. what is shown under the existing waiver. They're going to reflect, you know, the revised. So that was my point, is that there are other processes that happen after this that would require approvals to move forward that could also act as sort of a safety valve to make sure that you're not somehow taking advantage of the, both waivers in, instead of, or both portions of the waiver instead of one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that I one? could, if I could maybe just back uh, Rob up, but I, I guess the concern, now that I've heard it from Rob, is that while we can direct staff here, there's nothing holding them to it if we don't amend it. Is that, am I reading your mind correctly, Rob? I'm going to back Jim <laughs> up on this one. Now, it, it, as, as 
the other Rob said, I, 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 I would venture that the economic model would drive towards the cheapest way of implementing their plan, which would be to go with the purple A. And since they don't need the blue C, they probably wouldn't effectuate that way. Where it's more of a, a um, as a governing body, we grant waivers for needs and justifications that and they're saying they no longer have the need or justification for a waiver. So I would expect them to come in to amend amend their prior justification to match what they're now hoping to do and the waiver would reflect that. Not that we just say, okay, they don't need that waiver anymore. We'll leave that waiver in place because they're no longer going to use it and let's layer on this additional waiver on top. So, so I may, if I may, so this discussion we had with the applicant and I apologize for the applicant not being here. The concern on their part is if you begin opening up what was already approved, they're not going to move forward with the amendment. So by asking them to come in and begin rescinding stuff and altering the original vested environmental waiver, that provides uncertainty for them at this point so they will just go with what was already approved. So by limiting the scope now to you know, this, and again, you know, not implementing a right they already have, um, you know, that provides them certainty to move forward with this project you know, with the new design. Okay, now, um, Mr. Mayor, yeah, because now, now I'm confused. So if the waiver that's in place currently allows them to do what's in the uh, blue, by taking that out now and saying we're going to go with this new waiver, are we? Is the concern from the applicant that we're then limiting them to now I can only do this and maybe I still need to do? No, it, it's more a procedural um, review issue. So again, with what the request is and what the draft resolution says is the reality is they would not move forward with the light blue, but there's no legal instrument removing it from the consideration. The only thing that this resolution does is on is adding the additional, you know, almost 2,500 square feet to areas A and E um, to allow them this additional impact. Uh, again, the environmental waivers don't mandate that stuff needs to be done. It only permits those, those intrusions should they need to occur. Again, it would make no sense for them to move forward with both sanitary sewer lines. Right. Um, so, but their concern is to go back then and begin opening up for reconsideration the original environmental waivers. You know, that provides a level of uncertainty because there is no guarantee they will get approved again. So it's easier for them to, you know, hold with, you know, the application before you this evening or just go with what was originally approved. Can, can the process be bifurcated so that, like, if, for example, we were to approve this resolution tonight, and then a future meeting, we wanted to do some housekeeping and clean things up and, you know, later amend uh, the other uh, approvals to address the concerns of our colleagues. We could do that? Again, I, I would defer to Frank on this. As a legal matter, yes, you could. Okay. Just, I'm just trying to figure out a way to address that concern without holding things up, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the balance we're trying to reach. Go ahead, Neil. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one other thing. I think what I'm hearing you saying, Rob, is that if there was like a motion for a resolution to amend the waivers, even if it was specifically defined to only cover the parallel at, you know, the blue on the map, that there's a concern that once there's a discussion about that, it could potentially theoretically include changes to other things in the overall waivers that the applicant was granted. And that's what makes them nervous about the mm -hmm. uncertainty. It's not about this specific item. It's about what else might end up being in our discussion that we just don't, even if we don't intend to, we could, you know, s sort of drift into. Is mm -hmm. that, am I right about, is that what you're saying? Yeah, speaking on behalf of them, you, you, you know, this was sort of the internal discussions with them and what their concerns were. I mean, is the it process, well, though, that's, on, a, that's like on. a sentence. In, yeah. Sorry. We're going to Neil first, then we can go to you. Go ahead, Neil. Well, I'd just like to weigh in on the side of, the real world and practicality versus technicalities here. There's, it doesn't seem like there's any reason why the applicant would want to go forward with the previous waiver, which would be more expensive and more time consuming for them when they have a better approach that is practical. So I don't understand why we're diving into the weeds here for no apparent purpose that I can see. 
there, it just doesn't seem reasonable that the applicant would do anything other than what we're discussing today. That said, would you like to move the resolution? I would love to move the resolution. Do we have a second with the resolution as written? With all due respect to my colleagues, second. <laughs> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All the, any opposed, say nay. Okay, carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Is there a lesson learned for process improvement going forward? There always is. This, this gives us the ability for consideration. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Michael Wayand. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, evening, Mayor and City Council. Mike Wyan, Environmental Services Stormwater Program. The resolution I'm bringing you tonight would authorize the transfer of money to the Chesapeake Bay Trust to oversee Gaithersburg's FY24 stormwater grant projects. The city first partnered with the trust back in 2016. Since then, Gaithersburg has funded over $750,000 in community-led stormwater projects. Working with neighborhood associations, nonprofits, and faith-based institutions, we've supported nature play spaces, community science projects, and uh, native meadow plantings. <clears throat> um, along with that, this program has sponsored uh, well over 100 individual stormwater education and outreach opportunities for our community members. Uh, the funds for the program stem from the city's stormwater fee, uh, which can be found on your property tax bill, and uh, the grant, how the uh, grant process works is that we take in applications between May and July. These proposals are first reviewed by the Chesapeake Bay Trust Technical Review Committee, which is just a group of industry experts from across the Bay region. And then those top uh, rated grants are then recommended for funding and sent to us at the city for review. Um, then staff will go through those proposals to ensure that uh, the grant projects align with our city goals. <clears throat> Which uh, brings us here tonight for this upcoming FY24 grant cycle. There are five grant projects for a total of $18,859 that we'd like to support. <coughs> Um, we have the first project, University of Maryland. Uh, they would like to do a stormwater action plan with neighborhoods. Then we have the Isaac Walton League of America would like to do a salt watch initiative. Then the interfaith partners of the Chesapeake would like to work with green teams and uh, local congregations. And then we have the Church of Ascension of Gaithersburg would like to do a native pollinator garden. And then finally, the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center um, was hoping to work with the Timberbrook community to develop a stormwater master plan. <clears throat> um, again, this is a resolution for authorizing the city manager to allocate funds to the Chesapeake Bay Trust to administer the city's stormwater grant program. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Questions, comments, Ryan? Well, I just wanna say, I think this is fantastic, and I think um, this effort uh, could uh, be well served by some additional spotlighting uh, through you know our, our our city outreach and um, you know just marketing because I think it's great I don't think enough people know about it um, and um, you know this is wonderful I mean obviously we have enough partners who are applying for the you know for the grant money and have good projects that they're proposing but I think mm -hmm. uh, this would be great for us to showcase for the public a bit more so I just throw that out there for consideration but I think it's wonderful and I'm going to support it okay Jim. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with Ryan. Uh, we've heard a lot in this chamber about SALT from our good friend Carl, and uh, I think um, having the Isaac Walton League approach us about a program and being able to track that, as we uh, heard earlier, uh, the more data we have on all the different issues that we're tracking, the better. Uh, so uh, I 100% agree, and absolutely, um, you know, the more we can do to shine a light on these uh, kind of programs that we're supporting, I think the better. Okay. Rob. Ditto. <laughs> Rob, would you like to move the resolution? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. Carries 5 0. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Um, next, Ruth Lutero, Director of Information Technology. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. Ruth, Mayor. Ruth, you grab that microphone. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm here tonight uh, seeking your approval for a resolution authorizing the city manager to negotiate and enter into a contract for police staff book and mobile data computers. Tonight, here with me is Brian Helms uh, from Information Technology Group, 
of business division, and I have Lieutenant John Leach from the police department. So uh, you're probably familiar with this now. This is the police technology refresh project. Um, so the major technologies are covered within this project, like county radios, uh, vehicle camera system, in-car camera system, and body-worn camera, ruggedized laptops, and taser. Uh, th these technologies are currently in use and provide critical functionality to the police department. This hardware will be at, or in some cases, far beyond its planned replacement date and useful life expectancy. The IT department staff have carefully planned this project as we mentioned previously, <laughs> to replace all significant vehicle-based technologies simultaneously. Simultaneous replacement will provide meaningful operational and cost efficiencies to the city as vehicles will only have to be removed from operation once for a single set of combined installation activities. The police department follows the Montgomery County standard and utilizes Panasonic Toughbook raggedized laptops in most police vehicles. Staff issued a request for a code for replacement Toughbooks to eight vendors. Four vendors returned valid codes ranging from a high of 218,273 and 0 .03 down to a low of 201,186. The lowest code of 201,186 is higher than the FY24 budgetary estimate of 188,784, but it is offset in FY24 by lowering the estimate actual cost of the public safety radios, which we previously presented to you. This offset keeps the FY24 police tech refresh project cost, total cost under budget. Um, our staff recommends awarding this purchase to Frontline Mobile Tech LLC, who provided the lowest code of 201,186 via Howard County Service Contract 4400003684. I'm happy to an answer any question you might have for Thank me. Thank you, Ruth. Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, like you said, we've uh, heard about this a couple of times already. <laughs> um, you know, it makes sense. It's it's a well thought out plan. Um, mm -hmm. that, like you pointed out, the total cost of replacement of the tough books and the radios is under budget total. Um, it's an important piece of operating equipment for our police department. Uh, I appreciate all the work that the teams have done in, in putting all this together. Uh, I love the fact that we're doing the best that we can to reduce the amount of times that vehicles are going to be out of service. Um, so I think it's it's a, a very sound plan, and I plan to support it. Anybody else? Questions, comments? You want to move the resolution? I will move the resolution. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you all. Um, Next, Tony Berger, Director of Public Works. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening to you and to the rest of the council. Uh, the item I have for you tonight, um, I'm going to start the background by taking us back in time to pre-pandemic. In July 2019, the Samaritan Council approved a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Mansfield Oil Company for the provision and delivery of regular unleaded fuel and an amount not to exceed $160,000 annually. As we all know, as we went through the pandemic, um, we saw fuel prices rise and it required us to uh, request an amendment that was executed, requested, approved, and executed in March of 2022, um, increasing the contract amount to $270,000 annually. <clears throat> Over the course of the current fiscal year, um, the price of unleaded fuel has varied significantly uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year, we saw a high price of $3.85 a gallon uh, plummet down to a low of $2.05 a gallon in around December. And I have to mention that these are non-taxed prices. Now, there's actually, you know, just under $0.43 cents a gallon tax that's added above this that the city doesn't pay. 
Um, and this has proved challenging for our staff um, in monitoring and keeping track with um, our previous, previously uh, supplied estimates. Accounting for these significant variations in month-to-month -month pricing, staff have now calculated that the, need, the city needs to increase the annual contract compensation by $50,000 to maintain the appropriate amount of fuel on hand each month. Um, this will increase the not to exceed amount of this contract to $320,000 annually. I sincerely thank you for your consideration and respectfully request approval of the resolution authorizing the city manager to amend the existing contract for the provision and delivery of regular and light fuel. There are sufficient funds available in the current fiscal year budget, operating budget, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this you may have at this time. Thank you, Tony. Questions? Ryan. Uh, thanks, Tony. I, I, I understand the situation. I, I guess my question is, how does this relate to going forward into the future fiscal year? Is this really just about plugging the hole for the month of June until we start the next fiscal year, or does this affect our fuel contract for next year as well? well it, it does affect the fuel contract for next year as well, so it actually accomplishes both. Okay. Um, and it's you know, we're seeing just a wide variety of month-to-month -month pricing um, so that we're trying to accommodate for that, um, that variation. Thank you. So next year's contract is the 320000 It would be for the 320000 amount as well, a not to exceed amount. It's this yeah. year's and next year. Well, tacking on to this year's lower amount, but the next year's will be at that higher amount. Correct. Okay. We, we came out this year um, estimating, you know, going, when you go forward at the beginning of the year, you estimate, we were estimating around $2.81 a gallon throughout, you know, that we would pay on average throughout the year. So we see, you know, really significant swings up and down um, that, that are making it a hard target for us. And presumably, we say in the background materials, there are sufficient funds in the current fiscal year. Obviously, presumably, there are also sufficient funds in the upcoming fiscal year budget as well. I have to double check that, but I believe there are. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the suspense is over. Yes. All right. Uh, Neil. I'd like to move the resolution. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Okay. Carries 5-0. Thank, Thank you Tony. so much. Um, from the city attorney. Nothing tonight. I will yield. Okay. <laughs> well, you, will, you will tonight. have, you will have uh, Lynn back at your next meeting, actually, on uh, next Monday. Okay. Well, thank you for your work up here. Sure. Glad to be here. Done a great job. Um, anything from any other staff? Not seeing anything. Okay. Then I will remind everyone to um, join us at our work session next week for an update on the um, 355 bus rapid transit project and the transportation transportation land use connections in Old Town. And, uh, and I will remind everyone that the next regular meeting of the Mayor and Council will be on Tuesday, June 20th. Until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned.